Welcome to LG Ministry. We're glad you have chosen to watch our program. My name is Coogan Collins, and I'm the minister at the Long Grove Church of Christ. Our hope and desire is that you will open up your Bible and study along with us. Be sure to check out all of our lessons on YouTube. Now let's get to our lesson. Whenever you go out into the world and try to teach the non-Christian about God, many times you will find that people are simply not interested. One of the reasons I believe that many don't want to become Christians is because they don't understand the advantages of being a Christian. Instead, they would view becoming a Christian as being a big disadvantage. But why do they not see the advantage of being a Christian? Perhaps they have been watching those that claim to be Christians and cannot tell any difference between them and themselves. As I began thinking about this concept, I thought it would be appropriate for us to examine several principles that the world may consider to be a disadvantage of being a Christian. The world might say, there will be things I cannot do if I become a Christian. And of course the answer to this is yes, there are things you cannot do if you become a Christian. You must understand that whenever you become a Christian, you're supposed to start looking at things from a spiritual perspective instead of from a fleshly one. Notice what Paul says about the flesh and the spirit in Galatians 5 verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Notice Paul is making it clear that living as a non-Christian means living in the flesh, which is in direct contrast to living as a Christian who is supposed to live in the Spirit. If we are living by the Spirit, then there are many things that we can no longer do as we did when we were non-Christians who lived according to the flesh. Paul goes on to give us a list of those works of the flesh that Christians should not do. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is not a complete list of the works of the flesh that are sinful, but Paul covers all the other fleshly sins by saying, and the like. In other words, anything that is similar to these sins or any fleshly sin, these are the things that we need to stay away from because they are sinful. Those who choose to continue in these fleshly sins will not make it into the kingdom of heaven. But notice what Paul says about the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. These are the things that every Christian is supposed to be doing. We have to learn to be fruit inspectors. And I'm not talking about just inspecting the fruit of others, but inspecting our own personal fruit. So it's true that being a Christian has its disadvantages if you consider the works of the flesh as an advantage. But we must never forget that the pleasures that come from the works of the flesh are only temporary and they will never last. But following after God in His way, it has eternal rewards. Consider what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4, starting in verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. 
For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Jesus is our perfect example, and we are to follow his example. When you choose to become a Christian, it's going to take sacrifice. It doesn't just mean that you're going to have to wrestle with yourself because you're also going to have to learn to deal with your friends who don't understand why you don't do some of the things you did before. As Peter said, they will look at you as being strange because you had no problem doing those sinful things everyone else did before. So why are you stopping now? Making such a radical change in your life, that is going to probably cause you to lose some of your friends because they don't understand you anymore. You don't relate to them as well. And so whenever people begin to look at this from a worldly point of view, they can see this as a disadvantage. Paul also speaks about how those in the world have a hard time accepting their friends when they choose to become Christians. Ephesians 4 verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. The world is truly blind to the advantages of being a Christian. All they can focus on is how they feel or how they've done those sins their entire lives and don't want to change and they begin to despise you because you are representing something that they don't want any part of. Now I want you to really think about all those works of the flesh and then tell me honestly that you cannot lead a joyful life and a fulfilled life without engaging in those sinful practices. While it is true that people may gain pleasure from some of these works of the flesh, we must remember that these pleasures are only temporary and will not last through eternity. With this in mind, we can now turn the tables and look at some of the things that sinners cannot do. First, he cannot have a pure conscience before God. Anyone who practices the works of the flesh will be found guilty of sin before God. Second, the sinner cannot enter the kingdom of God. Third, a sinner can never find true satisfaction in the works of the flesh because they will always want more and more. So the real disadvantage is being a non-Christian, especially when we're talking about eternity, because who in the world would want to spend eternity in hell? The next thing the world might say is that there are some friends I cannot keep if I become a Christian. We already talked about this a little bit, but it's true. When you become a Christian, you will most likely have to get rid of some of your friends because some of your worldly friends will try to entice you to go back to your old sinful lifestyle, which you should never want to do. Paul tells us this, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. I'm afraid that too many Christians today underestimate the power and influence of a friend. This is why it's important for us to choose our friends wisely. I can remember when I was growing up that I had a friend and, and his mother would not let him hang around this other boy. Now the reason she wouldn't allow him to do this was because she had heard of the kind of things that he had done. He was known for doing drugs and vandalizing people's property. At first, this made my friend mad until later when he got older and understood why his mother had kept him from being friends with this individual. By the way, that troublemaker ended up finding himself in jail later on for all of his malicious behavior. Notice what Paul says about this in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord is Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their people, 
and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We must understand that anyone who is living in sin and is proud of it is going to be a negative influence on us. If we continue to hang out with people like this while they engage in their sins, then there's a real danger that we might start engaging in the sin as well because we don't like to be left out, especially if others seem to be having so much fun. A true friend will respect your new lifestyle and will not try to get you involved in their sins. A true friend can be a good prospect for sharing the gospel with. Based on what I have said so far, do you think the Bible teaches that we should have no association with those in the world whatsoever? No, it doesn't. If that was the case, then there would be no way that we could go out into the world and lead people to Christ. Even Paul speaks about the believer eating with the unbeliever in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 27. If any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you asking no questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. You see, there is no way around it. As Christians, we must associate with those of the world if we ever expect to lead them to Christ. But on the other hand, we must be very careful that we don't approve or engage in any of their sinful practices. So we can have worldly friends and make new worldly friends, but we must never allow them to influence how we are to live our lives and cause us to want to start living like them in their sinful ways. If we find ourselves being influenced in a negative way that will cause us to sin, then that is when we need to consider staying away from that bad influence. Notice what Paul writes in Galatians 6, verse number 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Here Paul is talking about a fallen brother and how we as Christians should try and restore them. But notice Paul warns them that we should be very careful in doing so because he doesn't want us to become tempted by their sins. This same principle applies to non-believers as well. Once again, let's turn the table and consider that the sinners are also limited on what friends they can have. I can tell you that a person who engages in sin would find it very difficult and uncomfortable to be friends with a person who stands for righteousness. A sinful person will feel like they have to act like they're someone else when they're around a Christian and they will get tired of wishing they could just be themselves. When I used to work on copiers a long time ago, many times my customers would act like themselves, but when they found out that I was a Christian, they would change the way they acted around me, and they would tell others, you better watch your language and what you say around Coogan because he is a good old Christian boy. This becomes even more prominent toward the end of my job because people found out that I was leaving copiers to preach the gospel. So in many instances, the sinner is limited to only having friends that are sinners as well. The next thing the world might say is that there are sacrifices to make and burdens to bear if I become a Christian. Once again, this is correct. The Word of God calls on Christians everywhere to make certain sacrifices and to bear burdens. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 16 verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any one desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Many people will find this very difficult to do in our day and age because we live in a society that teaches us over and over again that we must put ourselves first and everything else comes in second or third place. In fact, many psychologists will tell their patients that they need to stop putting others first and instead worry about themselves. We live in a time where people have the mentality that it's all about me. But when you become a Christian, you must learn to deny yourself and live your life for Christ by following His example. Philippians 2 verse 3, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, 
But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Another type of sacrifice that we must do is found in Romans 12, starting at verse 1. So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul is telling us that we need to dedicate our entire being to spiritual matters and not allow ourselves to become like the worldly so that we can be examples to those around us so they can see what true Christianity is all about. Think about some of the things that the world would consider too great a sacrifice to become a Christian. Some would not like the idea of sacrificing their time to serve the Lord. Many cannot understand why anyone would rather go to Bible study or worship service instead of taking their kids to a ball game or doing some other fun activity. If they only understood what God has done for us through the sacrifice of His Son on the cross, then they would understand what a privilege it is to worship God and to study His Word with those who have understood what God has truly done for us. Others in the world would find it very difficult to let go of their money by giving some of what they have earned to the Lord. They would consider that a great disadvantage. But to the Christian, giving is something that is done from the heart and is done out of joy and love for the Lord. The reason we can give with cheerful hearts is because we understand that the riches of this world are temporary and that we have a far greater reward waiting for us in heaven. We know that the funds that we give are being used for the kingdom of God. Notice what Jesus says, Matthew 6, verse number 19. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where the moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. These are just a few of the sacrifices that Christians make. Now let's take a look at some of the burdens we take on as Christians. Galatians 6, verse number 2, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Romans 15, verse number 1, We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak, and not to please ourselves. We are supposed to help others bear their burdens, which is what you would expect with being a part of a family. However, those who are in the world would be against this idea because many today are all about minding their own business and taking care of themselves. We cannot have this mentality as Christians. While we need to take care of ourselves as well, we don't limit that to ourselves or our immediate family. We need to think about other people who are not blood kin because that is the Spirit of Christ. As Christians, we are to love those around us and do what we can to help bear other people's burdens. Now, there is one burden that both the Christian and non-Christian must bear. We both bear the responsibility of how we lived our lives on this earth, and we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and also trust are well known in your consciences. Paul is saying that the reason they try so hard to convert people to Christianity is because as Christians we know what awaits those who are non-Christians. If only the non-Christians could understand the eternal punishment that awaits them, then maybe, just maybe, they might take a serious look at becoming a Christian. Instead of thinking that there are disadvantages to Christianity, they would be able to see that there are real disadvantages to being a non-Christian. Let's look at one last verse, Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your burden on the Lord, and He shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. As Christians, we cast our burdens on God, and He will be there for us, and we can be comforted by Him. However, the non-Christian has to deal with their burdens 
on their own, or they might try and push them on a loved one. But in either case, they cannot have the peace or the comfort that a Christian can have. In conclusion, from a worldly point of view, the life of a Christian may appear to have its disadvantages. But when you begin to understand that this life is temporary and that we will spend eternity in either heaven or hell based on how we follow the will of God, we can quickly see that there is no advantage of being a non-Christian, but there are real advantages of being a Christian. Hope you found this lesson helpful. No matter what lesson I preach, I want you to test what I say or any person says about God's Word by comparing what is being said to the Bible. Don't ever be lazy in this area because it is too important to simply trust in what a man is saying because we are all human and we're capable of being wrong. One thing we know for sure is that God's Word will not lead us astray, so we can always trust in it. As Psalm 146.3 says, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. Psalm 18, verse 30, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. I will always do my best to preach the truth, but I hope if you catch me teaching error that you will contact me so that we can discuss the matter. If you would like to learn more about LG Ministry and the congregation I preach at, feel free to visit our website at lgchurchofchrist.com. On our website, you will find a lot of material that can help you with your spiritual growth. On our main page, you will find an online correspondence course that you can take that will walk you through the basics. On our sermon page, you will find just about every sermon I've preached at my local congregation. You will also find some audio sermons and Bible class materials that you are free to study and use. On our article page, you will find tracts that you can read and print off and articles that have been written for our local paper. Finally, on our video page, you'll find our new video lessons like the one that you're watching now. I know we live in a fast-paced world where it seems like we don't have time to do much of anything. But I want to encourage you to find time out of each day to sit down and to study God's Word. Life is great and there's nothing wrong with being busy. But we must be careful that we don't get to the point where we get so busy that we fail to take time to feed ourselves spiritually from God's Word. We must remember that God is supposed to be our number one priority. If you find my lessons to be helpful, be sure and tell people about our program so that others can hear sound lessons from the Bible. I hope you have a blessed day.